Welcome to Wild Olive Studies, a Messianic Gentile study of the Hebrew Scriptures. I'll be your teacher and host. My name is David Nitchie, but you can call me Dave. In this lesson, we'll examine Rabbi Shaul, seeing him as a Jew. Seeing the Rabbi Shaul as a Jew. It's kind of silly, isn't it? A rabbi as a Jew? Well, again, um, I would like to start with a question as we normally do. And the question I'd like to start with today is, if Rabbi Shaul continued to identify as a Pharisee and of the tribe of Benjamin, wouldn't he also retain his cultural identity with the Torah? So think about that. He is called Paul, the Apostle Paul, but the scriptures also say that when Yeshua reaches out to him or talks to him the first time, he says, Saul, Saul. So he's talking to him within his cultural context. And as we've already developed the idea that when Paul is uh, speaking to his Gentile audience, he uses Paulos, but when he's speaking more to the, the Jews and the synagogues, he goes with Shaul. So it's a name that he uses in both cultures. So I'm going to say absolutely to this. He's going to retain his cultural context. In this episode of who Rabbi Shaul is, we will look at the cultural Jewishness of Rabbi Shaul, or as we call him, the Apostle Paul. We'll be using the David Stern translation of the Bible called the Complete Jewish Bible. After Rabbi Shaul's encounter with the living Torah on the Damascus Road, Shaul needs time to process, regroup, and hear more about the Messiah's command to take God's message of redemption to the Gentiles. According to his letter to the Assembly of Galatia, he writes, if you'll turn to Galatians 1 with me, we're going to read Galatians 1.17. Galatians 1.17. Galatians 1.17 says, I did not go, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were emissaries before me. Instead, I immediately went off to Arabia and afterwards returned to Damasek. The words that Stephen spoke before his death could not have been coincidence. In Acts 7, 37 through 38, we see this is Moshe who said to the people of Israel, God will raise up a prophet like me from among your brothers. This is the man who was in the assembly in the wilderness, accompanied by the angel that had spoken to him at Mount Sinai and by our fathers, the man who was given living words to pass on to us. Could the Spirit through Sp Stephen be speaking about him, Rabbi Shaul? Could the Spirit speak through him to the nations like he did through Moses? Was he that man? He had to know. Was he the one? So down he went to Arabia where the father gave instructions to Moses and his chosen people. When he does return from Arabia, Shaul says the first place he goes is to Jerusalem. Back to Galatians 1, verses 18 through 24. Galatians 1, 18 through 24. Now until three years later did I go up to Jerusalem to make Kepha's acquaintance, that's Peter. And I stayed with him for two weeks, but I did not see any of the other emissaries, the apostles, except Yaakov, or James, the Lord's brother, concerning these matters. I am writing you about, I declare before God that I am not lying. Next I went to Syria and Cilicia, but in Yehuda or in Judah, the Messianic congregations didn't even know what I looked like. They were only hearing the report, the one who used to persecute us, now preaches the good news of the faith he was formerly out to destroy. And they praise God for me, Galatians 1, 18 through 24. Now I want us to reflect on Shaul's words here. He has just spent three years on the backside of the desert, three years in the wilderness. Some say he's been in Petra, a familiar place for people who are wanting refuge, or people who are wanting to hide, hoping for the world to forget about them. Some say he's gone to Mount Sinai, where Moses received his mission, calling, and the instructions for leading the chosen people to the land. You would think that if he had some enormous earth-shattering revelation like, uh, what, the Torah has been done away with, or that it was nailed to the cross with Jesus, or it was fulfilled in Jesus, so that it has been rendered ineffectual, you'd think it would be pretty high on the list to bring up right about now, especially with the emissaries, the apostles. And you'd think there'd be some, maybe a little bit of discussion about it, and maybe something brought up in, our, in, our, in the book of Galatians. 
but no. After some more time, 14 years later, he says in Galatians 2.1, he goes up in obedience to the revelation. He continues. We're in Galatians 2 now. Galatians 2, 1 and 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. And I took with me Titus. I went up in obedience to a revelation, and I explained to them the good news as I proclaim it among the Gentiles. But privately to the acknowledged leaders, I did this out of concern that my current or previous work might have been in vain. Galatians 2, 1 and 2. Again, we see that his concern is that my current or previous work might have been in vain. Shaul is not a man that lives in a vacuum, nor is he a radical set on tearing down the rabbinical world in which a Jewish Messiah is a reality. There are plenty of Gentile gods and demigods that they have no place or relevance in the culture and land of the Torah. Again, if he would have been teaching anything contrary concerning the Messiah, Yeshua or the Torah, he would have been the, uh, he would have been the one drug out of town and stoned while the apostles held the outer garments of those who cast the stones. There is no hint that his theology has changed. He continues to midrash the scriptures in the rabbinical context to validate Yeshua as the one the scriptures foretold, and Yeshua becomes the context for interpreting the Torah for how to be obedient through the Spirit. I say this because Paul's letters to the Galatians have been used to prove that Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, was anti-Torah, anti-Israel, and anti-Semitic. A case in point. Let's look at Galatians 2, 15 through 16. 15 and 16. Again, it's, it's commonly said that, that Paul converts on the road to Damascus. And so what does that mean? He throws off his Jewishness and he takes on no religious um, uh, identification, which means he, he makes himself a Gentile so he can identify with Gentiles. Verse 15, we are Jews by birth, there it is, not so-called Goyish sinners or Gentile sinners. Even so, we have come to realize that a person is not declared righteous by God on the ground of his legalistic observance of Torah commands, but through Messiah Yeshua's trusting faithfulness. Therefore, we too have put our trust in Messiah Yeshua and become faithful to him in order that we might be declared righteous on the ground of Messiah's trusting faithfulness. See, he's still using Jewish language. He's still using halakha. He's still using the terminology that, that the Old Testament, the Torah, the Tanakh has um, teaches. Uh, let me read this again. Therefore, we too have put our trust in Messiah Yeshua and become faithful to him in order that we might be declared righteous on the ground of Messiah's trusting faithfulness and not on the ground of our legalistic observance of Torah commands. For on the ground of legalistic observance of Torah commands, no one will be declared righteous. Paul's words to the Galatians seems to take on the flavor of being anti-Torah. When he writes, we have come to realize that a person is not declared righteous by God on the ground of his legalistic observance of Torah commands. From these words, some Christian teachers hold that obedience to Torah, since Yeshua's atoning sacrifice is nothing more than legalism. If that wasn't bad enough, he goes on to say, for on the ground of legalistic observance of Torah commands, no one will be declared righteous. From this, they say that obedience to Torah has nothing to do with our relationship to God, that in Yeshua fulfilled the demands of the Torah so that we don't have to. Please understand, I'm not advocating works-based salvation. What Paul is countering here is the idea of how we come into the kingdom as Gentiles. Some in Galatia were under the impression that entering the kingdom is equated with national identity with Israel, so they would circumcise that the way into the family of God is through circumcision. Although on the surface, this sounds like the way to get familial benefits. For Paul, it misses the points of how we attain righteousness and entrance to the kingdom of heaven. For Jews, the way of entering into the family was by physical birth. Let's go to Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, verse 21. Very interesting passage. All your people will be Zadokim, in other words, they will be righteous ones. All your people will be righteous ones. They will inherit the land forever. There will be a branch I planted, my handiwork in which I take pride. The term Zadokim is the Hebrew term for righteous ones. So in essence, the verse is saying that the children born to the 12 tribes are considered righteous by God the Father and will have a share in the world to come. In other words, 
God declares that they're righteous. They aren't righteous of their own ability. They are considered as branches on the Father's olive tree, which He has planted. They are His handiwork, and, he shall, and they shall receive the care of the gardener to sustain and nurture them. For this to be true, however, Paul teaches that just as Abraham was counted righteous, so will his children be counted righteous if they believe the promise. Let's go to Genesis 15, 6. Genesis 15, 6. He believed in Adonai, and he credited it to him as righteousness. For Paul, faith leads to works. Paul's elaboration on his crediting his worked out in Romans 4. So he quotes this in Romans 4. Again, he's not abandoned the Torah. He is not unhitched from the Torah. He is entrenched in the Torah. And that's how he teaches how to walk as a follower of the Messiah. Romans 4, 22 through 25. This is why it was credited to his account as righteousness. But the words, it was credited to his account, were not written for him only. They were written also for us, who will certainly have our account credited too, because we have trusted in him who raised Yeshua our Lord from the dead. Romans 4, 22 through 25. How do you know what righteousness is unless you study the Old Testament? There's no definition in the New Testament. So I adjure you, I, I encourage you, Study about righteousness, study about holiness, study about these concepts that are only found in the Older Testament, in the Tanakh, and the Torah. For Paul, doing things contained in the Torah is not the issue. His issue is doing things contained in the Torah without faith and expecting blessing without first coming into relationship by faith with the living Torah through the person of the Divine Son. It is being obedient through the leading of the Spirit by faith. Yeshua also teaches this in Matthew 7 verses 13 through 23. Matthew 7, 13 through 23. Go in through the narrow gate, for the gate that leads to destruction is wide and the road broad, and many travel it. But it is a narrow gate and a hard road that leads to life, and only if you find it. Beware of false prophets. They come to you wearing sheep's clothing, but underneath they're hungry wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. What fruit? Their works of Torah. Can people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every healthy tree produces good fruit, but a poor tree produces bad fruit, the weightier matters of the law. When, when, when we don't abide in the fruits of the Spirit, then we're producing the fruits of the flesh, bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, a poor tree, good fruit. Any tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. Notice, those who do what my Father in heaven wants. What does the Father want us to do? The deeds taught in the Older, Older Testament, in the Torah. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. See, it's all about relationship. Relationship with the Divine Son. Get away from me, you workers of what? Lawlessness. Some versions say iniquity. Workers of iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness. It's Torahlessness. It's not talking about civil law. It's not talking about run and stop signs, as we'll talk about here in a minute. It's talking about disobeying the Torah. For Yeshua and Paul, the issue is not only obedience, but also relationship. In fact, John 14, 15. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commands. You can also look up 1 Corinthians 7, 19, where Paul says, keep the commandments. And by the way, if your kids are asked to do something and they don't do it, are they demonstrating that they love you or that they could care less about you? As a child, we want the approval of our parents. And the way we show that, we demonstrate that we love them back, is we do what they ask us to do. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. This is the passage that helps us define or understand the relationship between works and faith. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For you have been delivered by grace through trusting, and even this is not your own accomplishment, but God's gift. You were not delivered by your own actions. Therefore, no one should boast. See, there we go. This would, be, this would be, God, you owe me salvation because 
I've done this, this, and this. And that's what Paul's teaching against. For we are God's making, created in union with Messiah, Yeshua for a life of good actions, already prepared by God for us to do. See, that's why you're saved, is to so that you'll do good things. And what things are good? Those things that are defined for us in the Torah. That was Ephesians 10, or 2.10. Here he says that we are not delivered, saved, redeemed by anything we could do, but since we are saved, we are saved for a life of good works, our obedience to Torah. Obedience to Torah is not something we do to get saved. It is what we do because we are saved, because we trust him. I don't stop at a stop sign to earn a driver's license. I believe the state wants me to have a driver's license, and to get it, I learned that I am required to go through the state to get it. I stop at a stop sign because it's the law, and if I don't, there will be consequences. I don't worry I will be kicked out of the state because I miss stopping at a stop sign. I am aware, though, I may leave this earth if someone else is in that intersection, This and this concept gives me a healthy fear to stop before the white line. And back to the message of our session today. If Paul, the Rabbi Shaul, would have become convinced that the Torah was done away with, there would be no passages written by Luke to the contrary. He recounts this very accusation in three places concerning Rabbi Shaul. Let's go and look at those real quick. Let's go to Acts 23.6. Acts 23.6. Shaul looked straight at them, verse 6, and said, Brothers, I have been discharging my obligations to God. He calls his Torah observant observ obligations to God with a perfectly clear conscience right up until today. That's Acts 23.6. So he says he's been Torah observant. And this is later on in Acts. This isn't the beginning of Acts. Let's go now to Acts 25. Acts 25, verse 8. In reply, Shaul said, I have committed no offense, not against the Torah to which the Jews hold. See, he's, he's not breaking the Torah. He's not teaching to break the Torah. He says, not against the temple, not even against the emperor. He wasn't teaching anybody to be anti-law or anti-Torah. He wasn't teaching anybody to be disobedient, which he had been accused of. And let's go to Acts 26. We'll, re we'll start reading in the middle of verse 3, read to 5. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. That's Paul's message to us today. He's begging us to listen to him patiently. So then, all Jews know how I lived my life from my youth on, both in my own country, where is that? Cilicia in Tarsus. And in Jerusalem, they have known me for a long time, and they are willing, they can testify that I have followed the strictest party in our religion, the Pharisees. That is, I have lived as a Perush, or as a Pharisee. You see, Paul's own words are that everybody knows that he's Torah observant. Everybody knows he hasn't thrown off the Torah, that he isn't practicing some different religion that he came up with. Let's go to Acts 28, verses 17 and 18. Acts 28, 17 and 18. Brothers, although I have done nothing against either our people or the traditions of our fathers, you see, he's even obeying oral Torah when it lines up with the scriptures. I was made a prisoner in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and were ready to release me because I had done nothing to justify a death sentence. And why is he saying this? Because he was out persecuting people, f fulfilling death sentences on people who he believed were disobedient to the Torah before his, sal his, his, um, his uh, meeting with Yeshua. Words, however, are never enough if our actions speak to the contrary. Therefore, a careful plan was orchestrated to demonstrate Rabbi Shaul's loyalty and obedience to the Torah. God and the Jewish people, we begin reading in Acts 21. So if you'll turn with me to Acts 21, we'll read verse 21. Acts 21, verse 21. Now, what they have been told about you is that you are teaching all the Jews living among the Goyim to apostatize from Moshe. You see, that's what a lot of pastors are saying today within the Christian church, that Paul teaches that the law has been done away with. They use Galatians to cite that all the time. They're saying exactly the same thing that these religious rulers were teaching. 
telling them not to have a Brit Malah for their sons and not to follow the traditions. And a Brit Malah is a circumcision ceremony. It was rumored that Paul taught Jews that the Torah was done away with. The Gentiles were not under the law. So what did Paul, James, and the rest of the apostles come up with to squash this idea? Well, we now turn to the plan and the vow. I could say it's the show and the vow. Let's look at Acts 18.18. 18. Verse 18, Acts 18.18. 18. Shaul remained for some time, then he said goodbye to the brothers and sailed off to Syria, after having his hair cut short in Sancria, because he had taken a vow. With him were Priscilla and Aquila. So he's taken a vow now and he cuts his hair. And some of you, you're already thinking in your brain, you already know what this is all about. So let's get into this and find out a little bit more about it. What kind of vow had he taken? You see, taking a vow is a very Jewish thing. He's talking about a Nazarite vow. Let's take a look at Shaul or the Nazir. Shaul the Nazir or the Nazarite. Please turn to your Bibles to number six. Let's look at what a Nazarite is. Number six, one through four. Number six, one through four. Adonai said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel when either a man or a woman makes a special kind of vow, the vow of a Nazir, a Nazarite, consecrating himself to Adonai, he is to abstain from wine and other intoxicating liquor. He is not to drink vinegar from an either source. He is not to drink grape juice and he is not to eat grapes or raisins. As long as he remains a Nazir, he is to eat nothing derived from the grapevine, not even grape skins or the seeds. Let's continue to read in five and six, actually five through eight. Throughout the period of his vow as a Nazir, he is not to shave his head until the end of the time for which he has consecrated himself to Adonai, he is to be holy. So you can see that at the beginning of the vow, he's to cut his hair like he did in Sincrea where Priscilla and Aquila were at. So he is now then going to let his hair grow for this entire period that he's in the vow. So until the end of the time for which he has consecrated himself to Adonai, he is to be holy. He is to let the hair on his head grow long. I want you to understand that it says, when you do this, you are being holy. Okay, and a lot of Christians will say, well, Jesus makes us holy, and that is true. But being a Nazarite was given to them, and we'll get into this in just a minute to experience holiness at another level. Verse 6. Throughout the period for which he has consecrated himself to Adonai, he is not to approach a, cor a corpse. He is not to make himself unclean for his father, mother, brother, or sister when they die, since his consecration to God is on his head. Throughout the time of his being in Nazir, he is holy for Adonai. So what happens then? Let's go back to, let's continue to read in verse 13. This is the law of the Nazir, a Nazarite, when his period of consecration is over. He is to be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting. When it's over, keep in mind the cost of what he is going to be spending his money on. He now sacrifices. Let's go to number 6, 14 through 15. 14 and 15. Where he will present his offering to Adonai, one male lamb in its first year without defect as a burnt offering, one female lamb in its first year without defect as a sin offering, one ram without defect as a peace offering, a basket of matzah, unleavened bread, loaves made of fine flour mixed with olive oil, unleavened wafers spread with olive oil, their grain offering and their drink offerings. The Apostle Paul, our Rabbi Shaul, sacrificed animals after the crucifixion and ascension. That wrecks a lot of Christian's theology. Yes, even a sin offering. First, lambs without spot were the most expensive, one male and one female. A ram also, very expensive. The fine flour and unleavened bread and olive oil, all were very expensive. And this was voluntary on top of the normal daily sacrifice. It was going to cost him, both emotionally and financially, Again, there's money that's raised to help him in this because this is quite expensive. And it is emotionally, it is just very, it's an emotional experience to watch an animal die. And again, this is a voluntary sacrifice. Let's continue to read in verse 16 through 20. The Kohen is to bring them before Adonai, offer his sin offering, his burnt offering, and his ram as a sacrifice of peace offerings to Adonai with the basket of matzah. 
The Kohen will also offer the grain offering and drink offering to go with the peace offering. The Nazir will shave his, his consecrated head at the entrance to the tent of meeting, take the hair removed from his consecrated head, put it on the fire under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. When the ram has been boiled, the Kohen is to take its shoulder, one loaf of a matzah from the basket and one unleavened wafer, and then place them in the hands of the Nazir after he has shaved his consecrated head. The Kohen, verse 20, is to wave them as a wave offering before Adonai. This is set aside for the Kohen along with the breast for waving and the raised up thigh. Following that, the Nazir may drink wine. This is exactly what Paul does. If he hadn't, he would have been criticized again and punished. All this to prove he is not against the Torah. But this wasn't all that he would do. He took on the responsibility, the act of charity to help others complete the same vow. Let's go to Acts 21, verse 23 and 24. Acts 21, 23 and 24. So do what, they, do what they tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them with you, be purified with them, and pay the expenses connected with having their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there is nothing to these rumors which they have heard about you, but that, on the contrary, you yourself stay in line and keep the Torah. Here were four Jewish believers along with Paul that he must pay for under the direction of the apostles doing sacrifices in the temple, proving that he still followed Torah. Under the direction of James and the apostles, this proved the rumors false and that Paul still followed Torah. The interesting thing is that Paul had already written the book of Galatians seven years earlier. That's something to consider. Let's look at Galatians 2, verse 11 through 13. Furthermore, when Kepha came to Antioch, I opposed him publicly because he was clearly in the wrong. For prior to the arrival of certain people from the community headed by Yaakov, Jacob, or James, we call him James, he had been eating with the Gentile believers, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he was afraid of the faction who favored circumcising Gentile believers. And the other Jewish believers became hypocrites along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So knowing that Galatians was written first, do you think Paul's going to be a hypocrite? Or he's going to practice what he preaches? Do you think that Paul meant what he did, that is the vow? Of course he did. Was he doing it to earn righteousness with God? Of course not. Paul understands that taking a Nazarite vow in essence raised his level of holiness to that of a Levite. He was already counted righteous through faith in Yeshua. The vow then provided the unique opportunity to experience another level of set-apartness to God. I believe it was also a way to demonstrate to God and his brethren that he is a changed man, someone who takes obedience to God seriously. Paul kept Torah. He was not a hypocrite as he just accused Peter. Torah observation is in his nature. It is his obligation. He is righteous through Yeshua. His works demonstrate his holiness. Because of Yeshua, he has special status with God. Now he lives his life in obedience and loyalty to that credited position. Well, back to Galatians written to the Gentiles of Galatia who are not familiar with the Torah. I'd like to revisit Galatians 4. Galatians 4, 8 through 11. Galatians 4, 8 through 11. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them, by which nature are no gods. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereto you desire again to be in bondage. You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. This is not concerning Torah, but pagan customs, rituals, and celestial observations based on the zodiac. Gentiles never did service to God or the feasts of the Lord before they get saved. They did, however, worship at pagan altars and observe pagan holidays before they trusted in the hope of Israel. Did you know that Acts 21 events happened many years after he wrote Galatians? So. To take the passage and apply it to the Torah, think that it meant that Rabbi Tor, uh, Shua, uh, Rabbi Shaul did away with the Torah or God's instructions, then Paul's a liar. For us to misunderstand that these texts refer to anything Jewish, and here seven years later Paul is doing very Jewish things, means we view him as either a very big hypocrite or we have really misunderstood his text. Well, our time is way over, so be with us next time when we explore more of who is Rabbi Shaul. Until then, Shalom.